I'm glad to be with you tonight. And just a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to you about seven reasons why Jesus came the first time. I think at this time when it's Christmas, many people don't really understand why Jesus came. Uh, they think it's just about love and uh, just about salvation, but there's much more to it. And I shared those seven reasons with you last time. Tonight, I want to share with you seven reasons why Jesus is coming back again. Now, isn't it amazing? Just this week, we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, the first time Jesus came. But the New Testament speaks much more about his return than his first coming. And that's why it's so important for us as God's people to understand what is going to happen in the future. What's going to happen when Jesus comes back again? Now, in the book of John, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So Jesus came, died on the cross, rose again on the third day. And then 40 days later, he ascended up to heaven in front of the disciples. When they looked at Jesus going up in the cloud, they must have been very concerned. Because Jesus was leaving. That's why I said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I am coming back again. That is his promise. It is one of the most wonderful things that could possibly happen in the future. And I know many, many of God's people are getting confused and bewildered by all the nonsense that is going on in the world. But everything... Is working out according to his plan. God is in charge. God is on the throne. He rules supremely. Nothing catches him off God. Everything that takes place, God knows about it. Amen? Amen. And so the promise was that he would come again. And, the, and the, the, the message to the church at this time, even though we... Now it is Christmas and we are going to celebrate something that happened in the past. We look back with satisfaction, but we look forward with anticipation. We prepare ourselves, not just for the celebration of Christmas, but we prepare ourselves for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, He that has this hope purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin with us, what will be the end of them that believe not? And so I believe before the Lord Jesus comes, there's going to be an awakening. There's going to be a Holy Spirit revival. A lot of the nonsense that is going on today is going to disappear. And God is going to do a fresh work in the body of Christ. Multitudes of people are going to come to him and multitudes of people are going to experience the transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I can lift up our heads. We can look ahead with great anticipation of what is yet to take place. And so Jesus is coming. And uh, that is the knowledge that you and I must share. Now, seven reasons why he's coming. The first reason he's coming is coming for his church, the body of Christ. The Bible says in Thessalonians, we do not sorrow as those who do not have hope. For those that have gone to sleep in Jesus will God bring back with him. And those which are alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. So the first reason why Jesus is coming back, he's going to raise the dead and change the living. This is the blessed hope of the church. All those who have committed their lives to him, who are now passed away, who have died, even though he uses the word sleep, there's no such thing as soul sleep. When a person dies, it's not his soul that goes to the grave, it's his body 
His spirit soul goes immediately to be with the Lord. And so when Jesus returns with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the Bible says those that have died in Christ will be resurrected. And those which are still alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Mortality will put on immortality. Corruption will put on incorruption. And together we will be caught up in the air to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's going to be the judgment seat of Christ, not for you and I to be judged whether we good or bad. There's no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But at the judgment seat of Christ, when we have been resurrected and changed and meet Him in the air, we're going to receive rewards for what we have done down here in these physical bodies. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. This God is the God of grace. Not only does He save us, change our lives, bless us, but He's also going to reward us one day when we stand before Him. So the very first reason is coming for the church. Not for everyone, not for everyone that calls themselves a church, only for those that have been born again of the Spirit of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus very clearly, you can't, you can't get it clearer than this, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. First of all, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. So only those who will surrender to Christ and those who are born again of his spirit are the people that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming for. The second reason why he's coming, he's coming to overthrow the evil trinity. God is a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are co-equal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The devil is an imitator. The devil cannot create. The devil cannot read your mind. His power is limited. So he cannot create. The only thing he can do, he can cause. And he causes chaos throughout the world but he's an imitator. So he imitates everything that God does. He has his own trinity, which will be, the Bible tells us, the dictator beast will be that man that will rise up and say to the world, I have an answer to all your problems and all your issues. It is also what Revelation calls the dragon. That is the devil himself. And then also there will be a false prophet. So there's going to be a false prophet in the end time. There's going to be an antichrist man, which is, the, which is the dictator beast and the devil himself. And they are going to try and imitate the things of God. In fact, the Bible teaches us that the false prophet will call fire from heaven and he will confuse many people. And that's why it is so important that you and I get rooted and grounded and established in the word of God. We can't just float on the top. There must be roots. There must be understanding of what is taking place in the future. And the Bible says, And the lawless one will be revealed by the Lord Jesus who will overthrow him. The world is looking for a man right at this very moment. When you listen to the politicians, they're speaking about globalism. They're speaking about one world religion, one world bank, one world monetary system. Everything is going to become one because the devil is preparing a man who will be the dictator beast, who will have the solutions to all the problems that people are facing. And people are going to worship him. In fact, he is going to stand up in the temple of God and he is going to say that he is God. So there will be this wicked one. The Antichrist spirit is already in the world today. It was since the day of the disciples. There's been that spirit that is anti-Jesus, anti-Christ. But now there's going to be a man called the Antichrist. He's going to cause a lot of chaos, a lot of havoc. We can't go into it for, because of time. But Jesus is coming back. And what Jesus is going to do, he's going to take the false prophet and the dictator beast. And he's going to cast them into the lake of fire. He's coming and he's going to take Satan. And he's going to bind Satan 
for the thousand years. So Jesus is coming back to overthrow that evil trinity. The third reason why Jesus is coming, he's coming to judge the nations of the world. Now the Bible speaks of many judgments. Our sins are judged at the cross. Jesus became the scapegoat. But we must also judge ourselves. We will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. There's the great white throne judgment. There's the judgment of the Jews. And there will also be the judgment of the nations of the world. All the nations of the world that have rejected Christ, that have rebelled against Him, will stand before Him one day. And He is going to judge them. And Matthew speaks about them. Where Jesus says, I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. That's got nothing to do with poor people. It's got to do with the nations of the world. When judgment comes, he said, when they asked him, uh, who are these? When did we do that? He said, if you've done the least of this, if you've done the least to my brethren, you've done it to me. So in, when the church is taken, the, there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Great suffering upon the world is going to come from the Antichrist. He will first make a pact with Israel for the first three and a half years. Then he will turn against Israel and he will bring great suffering and great persecution to the Jewish people, the people of God. Now this verse is speaking about those people who will comfort the Jews, who will look after them, will care for them, will feel for them when they go through all that suffering and pain. And that's what he's talking about. If you are kind to the Jews during that time, you are going to have the opportunity to enter into the millennium, even if you're not born again, and have the chance along the way to be born of the Spirit of God. So all the nations of the world, he's going to judge every single one. The fourth reason why Jesus is coming He's coming for the salvation of Israel. Israel are the people of God. Right from the beginning in the Old Testament when Adam and Eve failed God, Adam and Eve were created for a purpose. And that purpose was to reveal the glory of God uh, to the nations of the world. They failed. They sinned. And God put them out of the Garden of Eden. Then He chose for Himself a people. And He said to them, you are a chosen people, a priesthood, that you can go forth and reveal my glory. So throughout the Old Testament, Jesus, God the Father, reveals His glory through the nation of Israel. They are the people of God. God has His hand upon Him. They are the apple of His eye. And so if you and I know, want to know exactly the signs of the end times, we must look at what happens to Israel. He says, those that bless Israel shall be blessed. And those who curse Israel shall be cursed. Isn't it an amazing thing? Over the many years, the great things that Israel has been able to do as a small nation. Those that go against Him go against God because they are the people of God. Nonetheless, God is going to judge Israel. And He's going to have the, the opportunity to receive Him as Messiah so that the, they can be saved. It says they will mourn over the one that they pierced. How will they mourn at the one that they pierced? They will say to Jesus when he comes, where did you receive those marks in your hands and your feet? Where did you receive those cars? And Jesus will tell him in the house of my friend, I came unto my own and they received me not. He's talking to the Jewish people. I came for you, but you rejected me. You despised me. You crucified me. And then when they see that, they will fall down and they will worship Him. And God will give many of them an opportunity to be saved. And so He's coming for the salvation of Israel. The Bible says in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, And all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion and He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them. I will take away their sins. That is the promise of God to the people of Israel. And that's why it's so important as us, who are who, the, the body of Christ. We, we're not Gentiles, we're not Jews. We are the new nation, the nation of God, the church of Jesus Christ. It is important that we continually pray for Israel, 
pray for Israel because God's hand is upon them. Then also number eight, he's coming again to usher in his millennium kingdom. Satan will be bound. The dictator beast, the antichrist, will be cast into the lake of fire. Hell is not the final destination. The final destination is called the lake of fire. Now Satan will be bound. And it says that Jesus will set up his millennium kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. He's going to rule from Jerusalem. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. This Jesus that we cannot see, that we worship and that we praise and that we talk to and that we pray to, that same Jesus is coming back again and he's going to rule and reign from Israel and every person will see him visibly. It is the kingdom, the millennium reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 20 speaks about that. Also, Satan will then be in the bottomless pit. After the thousand years, God will release Satan and he will take all the people that did not submit to God in the millennium and that were born then and he will turn him against Jesus and that will be the final battle for eternity it is called the battle of Gog and Magog he will get all these people the nations of the world and he will turn against Jesus but Jesus and the armies of heaven are going to destroy him and defeat him and Satan, for once and all, is going to be where the dictator beast and, and the false prophet are in the lake of fire for all eternity. And so there is coming a day which is called the millennium when Jesus will sit on the throne and rule supremely. It will be a time of peace. It will be a time of joy. It will be a time of hope. It will be a wonderful time when Jesus himself is ruling and reigning here on earth. And then number six, he's coming to judge the wicked of all ages. The Bible calls it the great white throne judgment. And every man, every woman that was ever born will stand before him. And they will be judged and cast into the lake of fire. If they never received him, if they rejected him. But this is what happens in Revelation. It says the book of life will be opened. And if their names are not in there, then they will be separated from him from all, for all eternity. And this is how I take that. It's a little bit different than most people, but many times people say when, when a person is saved, there's a new name written down in glory. In other words, when a man or a woman or a young person comes to Jesus, they say their names are written in the book of life. I believe it's a little bit different. I believe from the beginning of time, God knew every single person that will be born. And he's put every person's name in the book of life. But those who've rejected, at that time, their names will be taken out. And so it's so important that we preach the whole gospel. That we preach the truth and nothing but the truth. Because it's only truth that will set people free. In this day and age, the church cannot afford to fool around. We are going to begin to see many, many strange things happening. Wickedness is going to abound. The hatred is going to abound. False prophets and false teachers are going to be full up. That's why it's so important. Every person who comes to Christ takes their salvation serious. Examine yourself. See that you're in the faith. Give your very best for God. Be totally committed to Him. Don't be sidetracked. Don't let things rob you of the joy of the Lord. Don't let other things that are non-essentials in life take you away from your service to God. Give Him everything, just like you would if you're a sportsman or an artist or a teacher, whatever you do, you give everything. Give everything to God, especially in this day and age. It is this day that the world must see a holy church, a righteous church, we cannot afford scandals. We cannot afford rottenness and sickness and disease and sin 
rampant in the body of Christ. There needs to be a spirit of repentance when people who are not walking in the light need to kneel before God and make right with God. The church needs to be right because the world is in danger of God's judgment. And if we preach the truth and we live the truth, we the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We give every man, every woman, and every young person a hope for the future. Amen. Amen. The last thing is going to introduce eternity. Eternity. Adam and Eve were created for eternity. No sin, no sickness, no death, no pain, nothing. But they disobeyed God. And because of one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. So death was passed upon all men. But Jesus came where Adam was disobedient. Jesus was obedient to the death of the cross. And because of that, Heaven is opened up, and God is welcoming every man, every woman, every young person to come to Him. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more disease. There will be no more stealing and killing and lying and rape. All those things will pass away, and we will spend eternity in the presence of a loving, caring God. He's a God of purpose. From what He purposed from the beginning, will surely come to pass. Nothing is going to stop God. Nothing is going to stop the church. God's plan and God's purposes will be fulfilled. So as to us, the children of God, go through the troubles, go through the sorrow, go through the heartache, always with the understanding and the knowledge that God's mercies are new every morning and that He saves the best wine for last. In other words, the best is yet to come for every child of God. Now let me close. We need to be ready. That's why he explains it to us. I know it might be a little bit busy tonight, uh, but I, I don't expect you to understand everything. I just want to give you an outline so that there's something that you can hold on to because we need to hold on to something, amen? And what better to hold on to the truth of God's word? But now we have to be ready, every one of us. And I don't know where you stand tonight, but how do you get ready? You call upon the name of Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I just love it when our worship team sings about the name of Jesus. There's just something special about that name. And through my experience as, as a pastor for so many years, I've noticed that every time the church gets together and we sing about the name of Jesus, we lift up the name of Jesus, the atmosphere changes. Something supernatural begins to happen. There's power and authority in the name of Jesus because He humbled Himself unto the death of the cross. Therefore, the Father has highly exalted Him and bestowed upon Him a name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus. Thank God there was a day in my life when I called upon that name. I was a drunkard without hope, nowhere to turn. And when I called on the name of Jesus, something supernatural happened. And I still believe He does it today. Amen. Secondly, repent of your sins. Turn around. Let go. Walk away. Put it behind you. Thirdly, surrender to Jesus. Let Him be Lord of your life. Jesus, you don't want Jesus just to save you from the mess you're in. You want Jesus to rule in your life so that you can enjoy the life that he's come to give. He said, I've come that you may have life and that more abundantly. And it's only the person who, who surrenders their life to Jesus and say, Jesus, take charge, take control. Be on the throne of my heart. And then also you confess him before men. Tell others what you have done. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be a witness in this day and age. Be rejoicing because Jesus is coming back again.